Hi everybody, my name is Adrian, and I'm a PhD student from Chelsea. Um, yeah, so my background is in interior design um, and architecture, spatial design and visual arts. Uh, so my journey began uh, with my undergrad degree in interior architecture in Auckland, New Zealand, which is where I'm from, um, which then led to my MA in interior spatial design at, at Chelsea. Um, yeah, and now I'm on my PhD journey once again at Chelsea. So today's presentation is about my practice-based research that investigates spatial design as a form of interrogative design, which is then applied to the issue of homelessness in London, of course. So to summarize, um, my research sits within the field of interrogative design. Um, it combines art and design practice with critical design practice in order to highlight the issue of homelessness. So as we know, homelessness is an important social concept in art and design practice, um, as it examines the way space is treated in relation to the body and public private space. So this type of practice led research is distinguished from other socially informative practices um, by factors such as public intervention um, and investigating the boundaries between the body and architecture in relation to the concept of homelessness again. So as we move forward, um, you know, in London, there are at least 320,000 uh, people um, living in Britain at the moment that are homeless. And so the issue of homelessness in London has grown exponentially. Um, there's been a 15% increase since 2017, which is stated by a homeless charity called uh, Crisis. So nearly 9,000 people sleep rough on the streets of London every year. They come from all walks of life um, and many of them, you know, really want to find work. So we have different contributing factors that contribute to this and some things like, you know, different things like how successive governments have failed to address these underlying economic um, absences in affordable housing and suppression of the, the um, living wage levels contribute to things, you know, relating to homelessness. So my research applies um, such loss of capabilities in relation to the body and its rituals um, when denied the privacy of home. So the ghettoizing of homelessness in London has consequences for how private and public, um, private and domestic activities take place, sorry, within full public view. Um, so such factors contextualize my research, but the aim at the moment is not to propose a design solution to um, such a complex issue, but to investigate the spatial practices that draw attention to this area of social justice. Um, so as a spatial designer and practice-based researcher, I do bring certain skills and sensibilities towards domestic space in particular. Um, my practice focuses on using design methods as a way to understand or have a deepened understanding of certain situations. Um, so if we move more into it, this is, you know, this table shows the boroughs of London with the highest rates of homelessness in London, obviously. Um, so this comes from statistics that were released by Homeless Charity Shelter in 2018. So the borough, with, the borough with the highest rate of homelessness in London is the East London Borough of Newham. So it shows one in 24 people are homeless in that particular borough. Um, so these figures come from that particular report. It's called the Homelessness Monitor report. And you know, it's this kind of information that is important to understand the degree of urgency related to the social issue. You know, and these type of technical reports are, you know, become the basis for my practice. Um, so moving more into the practice, um, my, my research begins to conduct an anonymized inventory of these private domestic rituals um, necessarily carried out through drawings and maps um, and photographs of traces of inhabitation as you've, as you've seen in the previous slides. Um, so homelessness impacts communities on many levels and, you know, as I mentioned before, my intent 
was to emphasize the social justice needed for this area of concern and respond through the lens of a spatial designer um, to the issues of homelessness that are progressively forced to become less visible. So this particular work in progress is a spatial inquiry um, that shows the boroughs with the highest rates of homelessness according to the statistics from the previous report, from the previous slide, sorry. So it's important to note that the boroughs on this um, piece that don't have a designed logo had no statistics in the report. So this kind of thing could be read in two ways. One uh, would be the people that are writing the report were not provided the data for those boroughs or the government the government's refusing or inability to address the issue um, in all its social capacity. So my research, um, so sorry, uh, moving on. So my intention with this work is to create a logo, um, no, to create a dialogue actually about how the city controls space for the homeless through data representation and spatial mapping. Um, so the symbol of wonderful home uh, shown in the bottom right corner, sorry, left corner. The symbol of wonderful home represents 15 homeless people. Then you get the three quarter, the half and the quarter home, which then equates to 11 people, eight people and four people in the boroughs. So these values were derived by calculating the population um, of people per square kilometer in each borough against that homeless report that we saw from the previous slide. So this work uses the design logo of a broken home to represent the statistical value placed on homeless people. Um, it represents the, sorry, it represents society's perception on, its, on the issue of homelessness today. Um, you know, it's an issue that is known but is purposefully neglected or is being pushed out of visibility. My work currently consists of sketches that are analysing the shopping trolley. Um, so a device that is used by homeless people to transport their belongings um, from place to place. So these sketches are the beginning of many to follow that investigate and stimulate a dialogue about mapping, the mapping of spatial typologies, um, patterns of inhabitation, and will rethink an otherwise instrumentalized issue, uh, problem, um, as well as understanding how the role of a designer might highlight and find solutions for issues of privacy in relation to domestic, to the domestic rituals of the homeless. So my, my intent, as mentioned, is not to change policy, but to emphasize um, a need to understand alternative perspectives um, and counter cultural ideas. Yeah, so my, re my research will continue to create that dialogue through social interventions um, that seek to make conscious the issue of homelessness um, and its relation to spatial design and invite the public to renegotiate their perception of homelessness and the area between public and private space. Um, so for, for some time now, I have been positioned between art and design practice, you know, and exploring the intersection, the intersections of solving um, real world design issues. So I trace the, oh, sorry, that went a little bit too fast. Let's just go. Ahead. Um, I trace the uh, multi-layered relationships of art and design practice and in doing so I draw on a range of ideas from a range of disciplines. Um, yeah, so as we come to the, to, to the end and, you know, I know this was supposed to be a very long talk, but, um, you know, I could go on for a long time. Um, as I come to the end, um, I just wanted to leave with this particular quote and just talk now about, um, you know, as we're all aware of the current unprecedented crisis that has developed, I just wanted to end by explaining how the coronavirus pandemic has influenced my research to date. So as part of my practice, I plan to embed myself 
in different organizations working with homeless people um, or people that have experienced homelessness. Uh, one of the organizations is Cafe Art. So if you don't know, Cafe Art is an organization whose mission is to empower people affected by homelessness through, um, through their art, photography, and entrepreneurship. So I intended to work closely and collaboratively with, these, um, with, with the people that have experienced homelessness uh, in order to keep their voices at the forefront of the conversation. Um, however, the coronavirus began to shut down cities. It has become increasingly difficult to navigate this part of my research. Um, you know, this is a time where the global economy has almost shut down, but we also have seen substantial efforts and rapid response from governments and private sectors in response to the risks of exposure faced by people who are homeless during this pandemic. Um, but as we move forward to rebuild our lives and the economy, we as a society are faced with the issue of increased homelessness um, among the most vulnerable people in our communities. Um, so, which is why I wanted to end with this quote. So this quote is, design must, must articulate and inspire communication of real, often difficult lived through experiences rather than operate as a substitute for it. A wonderful quote by Christoph Budichko, who is a leading theorist in the, in the issue of interrogative design and its position to, and its role within design in general. Um, so why I wanted to end with this quote is Christoph, um, as explained, as he explained in the quote, um, explains spatial design and design in general, its role to society. It talks about how um, interrogative design responds to the high level of ethical alertness that it creates. Um, it is understanding the urgency of an everyday ethical condition, um, an ongoing motivation for critical judgment towards the present and past to secure a future, to secure a vision for a better future. So I just thought, um, you know, this is something that I have been trying to embed in my research, how I can respond in such a way to the issue of homelessness in London. So yeah, that is what I'm doing. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. That was really great. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll let you yeah, unshare your screen. Um, so, I mean, we haven't got any questions in the chat yet, but uh, like anyone, please feel free to sort of like raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Uh, if you've got any questions to ask Adrian, I did notice that a couple of you did sort of enter um, like quite late in the talk, but uh, that's absolutely fine because we've got a bit of time for discussion. So if you want to sort of like, you know, go into a bit more detail and I'm sure like Adrian, you'll be fine to like maybe repeat any aspects uh, of your talk if ever some people have missed those. Um, like I, like I'll start off with a question that kind of, oh, I realised my video is off. Um, yeah, so I'll start off with a question that I have, so like in regards to your work and so like really what you've been doing up to now. Uh, just like quickly to know which stage of your PhD are you in? I can't remember if you said that. Yeah, sorry, I didn't actually. Um, I am in my second year, so I'm going to, working towards my confirmation at the moment. So as a practice-based student, that is when all the practice should be produced. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, because you've already started doing like this practice around like sketching and um, uh, what I was wondering was sort of like if you'd started like maybe like actually speaking with like homeless people at, at this point, because uh, what I found interesting was the fact that uh, your drawings are really sort of like looking at those traces of, you know, like these people living outdoors. And that feels very much like close to like the perception that we have as, you know, someone who's outside of that community and who's, you know, privileged in that respect and that we walk past these sort of like, you know, makeshift shelf shelters and that's really what we see of like homelessness. It's kind of, it's what um, like takes precedence over like the person who's actually sitting, you know, amongst those like pieces of cardboard and those rags. And that's mm -hmm. what you're representing in your sketches. So I was wondering if like, this was maybe like either a next phase of your research or if it's something that you started thinking about, like how 
there are these like two aspects there's like you know the visible sort of installation which is might be part of your practice as a spatial designer and the person mm. behind it so if you could elaborate on that yeah sure so um that is actually the next stage so as i spoke um towards the end of the, pr the presentation the limitations of the current situation um meant that you know with the lockdown and everything happening i was not able to go out and engage directly with the people that have experienced or that are experiencing homelessness um but my engagement is with people that are experiencing homelessness through um charities or organizations that are working directly with homelessness so people that have been homeless are currently homeless or you know in a position to maybe become homeless um, so i will work with them to navigate and show the value of art and design in order to you know support and help them because as an art practice or as a practice in general um, the ability to let's say create something um, will, that you can keep that is a representation of your struggle or your personal situation at that time, um, may then be able to generate a revenue that you can keep. So it gives them a sense of empowerment and entrepreneurship to teach them how they can use just one skill um, like that to uh, bring themselves out of the troubles that you know, they are facing. That's really interesting. Actually, I mean, um, so like anyone, just feel free to raise your hand uh, as you're muted. But I'll just keep on asking questions until you uh, like feel uh, inspired to sort of like jump in. I hope if anyone doesn't know how to raise their hand um, in Zoom, just like feel free to write in the chat, and I'll unmute you in uh, in that way. But otherwise, like you know, just use the raise your hand function. Um, yeah. So like the question that I wanted to ask was sort of like following from what you just said. And because you're practice based and you're a spatial designer, I was wondering how you were seeing, like, obviously, you know, at this stage, it might still be a bit um, like you know, open, but if you had any ideas about how your practice would actually sort of like contribute to your research and what you're seeing yourself doing in terms of like spatial design. Yeah, so, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, what essentially is supposed to happen, or well, the plan, let's say, from, it was actually in March, from March, was, no, from the end of, yeah, from the mid-March, when this whole situation started, mm -hmm. um, because I've been working previously with Cafe Art, so I really work and volunteer there, um, it was to engage their community, because what they do is they go out and photograph, um, everybody gets given a, a, a digital camera, not a digital camera, sorry, a disposable camera, um, and they take those out, and they're given a brief, and the brief, generally for London is called My London. So what happens is they go out and they photograph, you know, what it is to be in London for them, as opposed to the general thing of photograph your homeless situation or where you sleep, do you know what I mean? Um, which is, can be degrading a little bit. It depends how, how you look at it, but um, so that's what they do. So working with them to, bring my skills as an interior architect and as a spatial designer um, to add on to that, to give them a more, you know, open view of investigating their spatial inquiries, because that is essentially what it is. Um, you know, anything we inhabit can generally fall into the spatial design, um, you know, area. Uh, so teaching them those kind of things, you know, the perception of space, how to navigate that, um, Will then give them another level of empowerment and understanding in their photographic skills along with um teaching photography skills um so that's that's the embeddedness that i talk about when i talk about embedding myself in the practice as opposed to just coming in from the outside as just another design student or another art student that just wants to um exploit the the issue because that that really is not my my point you know that's not my concern my my concern is to show how does the role to show the role of design on such a you know multifaceted issue because there are so many different complex things that contribute to homelessness but if we can show the role of design then that could essentially be moved on to show you know the policy makers how important it is to 
um, put funding and to help them in that way so that they can then re return back to society instead of saying, you know, the current way it works is we'll try and find you a home. If we can't find you a home, we'll put you in temporary accommodation and they'll stay there for years. They won't move. They won't work. They won't be able to get back to work. So we're just trying to break that cycle. It's really interesting. Thanks a lot. Um, we've got a question here, so I'll unmute you. Um, and uh, but please introduce yourself and like go ahead with your question. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Pont. Uh, I did my MA ISD last year at Chelsea. Um, and yeah, I have a question regarding the, um, you know, the pandemic that's going on right now. Um, obviously, this is really unprecedented. And when you started your PhD, clearly this it wasn't something that was going on at that point. So maybe your perception of um, homeless and, you know, basically your research um, must have been slightly different from what is going on right now. And I was just wondering, um, with this happening right now, um, how much has that affected your research in, in terms of like, are you still tackling the problem with the same intention that you had in mind before? Or how, like, as in like, how much is this going to deviate or influence your research? Um, yeah, that's a great question. To be honest, um, Pont, uh, once everything began, I literally uh, got to a point where I was like about to break down and cry because I thought, um, you know, I have a plan and my plan is not going to work if, if with something like this and I didn't know what to do, you know, how can I help these people? How can I engage with this community um, if they have you know, little or no access to things that we have access to, even, you know, the internet, something basic like that. As all the stores closed and, you know, the general places where you can go to get free Wi-Fi, charge your phone, things like that, those were take that stuff like that was taken from them. So how can I, you know, still engage with them um, on this level during this time whilst also adhering to the government regulations and rules? with social distancing. I probably sat in my house, like almost crying for like three weeks and I did nothing. I was almost broken, but then I thought, you know, it's such a, this is the time in fact, I, I had like a wow kind of moment. I said, you know, I looked at what I was doing and I thought this is the time for us to actually speak out and be more active as a, let's say activist in this kind of um, situation and try to do everything that we can. So, um, you know, I've been out helping volunteer and delivering food for people that can't get out. Although these people are not homeless that I'm helping at the moment, they are still vulnerable. So with the homeless communities as well, um, you know, I'm out trying to just give supplies where I can and lend a helping hand and deliver food to them because most people that are homeless um, were able to get temporary accommodation in um, hotels and stuff like that. So still keeping in contact with them, um, trying to keep on top of, you know, the government's response and what they're doing for, you know, poverty and everything like that in this current time. Um, but also staying in contact with the organizations that I plan to work with and offering my support to them remotely that way. So I had a moment where I thought, oh my God, I'm stuck. It's like, it's over. <laughs> I can't do anything until I can go out. But in a matter of fact, it changed the direction of my practice. Um, yeah, so it's changed the direction of my practice, but in a way that will allow me as a spatial designer to now start to think about what type of devices can be designed, which is what I'm working on now, is what type of devices can be designed to help with, you know, the safe delivery of food, let's say, or the protection of the people that are handling the food, or the protection of the people that, for example, when you go, if you want to go buy your coffee now, your local coffee place is open, you'll notice that it's probably barricaded and they've got like some little tiny square in their, in their door somewhere letting you, where they just place your coffee on top. So how can we think as designers to help the situation and to move forward in terms of design now 
for a better future later. So if in any case, something like this was to happen, what contribution could we have? Um, and that in itself is a very, very, very big question, I think, and it's a big ask because as a, you know, a researcher, a PhD researcher, generally you, you work by yourself. So now it's about making the connections and finding, you know, the people that are out there that are thinking the same way and working together because that's the only way that, you know, we can move forward now. I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it's really interesting because um, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk a bit more. Um, it's just the other day I was uh, looking through, I think, a design documentary and it was talking about how um, deaf and blind people these days, clearly before all of this happening, they were relying so much on textile and touching things. But now that, um, you know, what they were able to do is no longer allowed. How would these people live in the same society? So I, I was just thinking, obviously, homeless people were having their ways of living back then. But now that it has changed and as spatial designer, clearly we have to introduce new ways of living to people and that's rather challenging to us and to them as well so it's just really interesting to see how you would take this forward yeah i think that's really good um but that's why i spoke about you know designing for you know with the the ethical conditions of everyday life so it's important to understand for me particularly i mean you can be any type of designer you want it's it's up to you but um, I believe that good design comes from understanding the person's needs as opposed to designing something aesthetically that is pleasing because it's very easy to design something that's aesthetic, but the functionality or the purpose of it doesn't serve that person's particular need, um, which then to me is not really good design. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, that question. I think it, it's like, it's really interesting how, I mean, obviously the situation is uh, awful in all sorts of ways, and it, but it really has highlighted the importance of a home. And I think a lot of people who are badly homed as well as like homeless are like suffering from this mm. and realizing that, you know, the circumstances have changed and made situations a lot more sort of drastic all over the place. Um, and I was wondering actually, because like, this is obviously like a sort of, you know, um, paradigm shift kind of moment in history potentially, um, and a lot is being sort of like taken on by government. And I was wondering if uh, through your work you also had that connection to sort of like policymakers, and if you were sort of uh, connecting between like the people that you're trying to design for and the people who are actually sort of like making the law in that way. Yeah, um, not at this particular moment, no. But the plan is to do that once. Um, you know, everything comes to fruition, and hopefully it does, um, I will then be able to have something that I can use to take to them, to show them, you know, because that would be like evidence-based research, isn't it? Um, on how we can address a particular problem or address a particular part of a problem or a situation um, for better. And I think, you know, when it comes to taking things to policy and stuff like that, um, in this particular in london as it's not where i'm from i'm not 100 percent familiar with that whole process but um that doesn't say that you know that's not something that i can find out and look into um but i would just feel more comfortable to do it with something more solid and you know actively working or evidenced in some way as opposed to going with you know my opinion about something because anybody can have an opinion as well but I also think it's really good to bring something like that to those type of um, meetings or places because we just have a different perception of all things spatial, I think. You know, sometimes uh, policymakers only look in a kind of lateral way that's there, you know, this is the problem, this might be the solution, we can do one, two, three, give it to someone and let them try and see what happens. But I think designers or artists or you know the creative industries we we come from a different um point of view i feel like when it comes to any issue political or not political we can always offer something that they wouldn't and i think the point now is to show them how important that is to 
you know, to making policies and to changing what's happening in, in hopes to move forward in the future. I think that highlights something really interesting about design research and how like one of the sort of really important parts and sort of uh, like elements of agency that there is through uh, these methods is actually being able to investigate questions with like creative approaches and in a way design is already part of understanding uh, the issue so it's yeah. really interesting to think of that, of that in that context so obviously um, like I mean I'm a PhD student also but like in a completely different um, uh, sort of fields and seeing those parallels and the ways in which we can actually sort of like use our design skills to like go and sort of uh, poke at questions in different ways and like then bring that new information from a different perspective back to sort of like a common table where decisions are made is really interesting. Um, yeah. We've got uh, like a few more minutes for any extra questions if anyone wants to jump in we've got about five minutes uh, for those questions like please, please feel free any comments also um, that would be Really nice to hear from from you. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say whilst um, people are thinking about whether they want to have questions or not, um, what what talking about what you were saying about you know coming from a different field. Um, my MA project looked at homelessness again, but um, from a microbiological point of view. So. I was looking at it in a completely different light to what I'm looking at it now, but my research now will draw on that at a later stage. So when I say microbiological point of view, I'm not a scientist, okay? Um, but I was able to show how, you know, the growth of these sustainable materials, because I know you talk about sustainable materials, but also in a different way, um, uh, how the growth of these sustainable materials can be used to highlight a specific issue um, you know something that was so tactile that came from it was you know grown simply through bacterial cellulosis um, during my MA created so many questions and people were engaging with the work you know I created a wearable structure that um, anonymized the user so they were able to walk around and you know move through the space and people thought you know wow this is really quite interesting and you know to touch it was very nice because it felt like a skin because that's what I was looking it was like a membrane between you know the the viewer and the person wearing it um, and they really wanted to touch it and they loved it but when I told them how it was made um, it was almost like they were disgusted but the fact of the matter is that was the point you know the point was to highlight the surfaces that these people have to endure um, and it really did that so yeah, I don't know. Is there is there any more questions? Yeah, there is a question there. Um, yeah, Adrian. Hi. Um, just wondering because um, obviously I did my MA last year and um, I was very uh, intrigued and interested in doing PhD if possible in the future. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of wondering um, what kind of influence you to continue your PhD in the field of spatial design and like what made you decide that you wanted to do a PhD pretty much. Sorry, you were just wondering what made what made me decide to do a PhD. Is that what you said? Yeah, like from your MA, what kind of influenced you that? Oh yeah, I want to continue my studies even deeper in the field of spatial design. Like, what what was that factor? Um, I think it just comes down to the fact that there is. Um, Letitia said this very well. Design research. Design research is an underrepresented field. Um, spatial design research, even more. Um, because anything can constitute spatial design research. I think the interesting thing is making the connections between all the multiple disciplines that can influence design or spatial design. So because I was looking at homelessness and exploring the different um, connections between that, you know, a lot of my work has to do with the body and you know, the body and architecture and place and space, um, things like that. So transitioning and, you know, how we inhabit space. Um, I felt like the MA, it just wasn't long enough for me to um, say conclusively that I have addressed an issue and I have contributed all my thought and all my knowledge because as I spoke of before, the application that I, the, the piece I was talking about before um, 
which anonymized the user and was grown through bacterial cellulosis. And I'll just share my screen with you just now, just to show you that. So you can have a, a vision of what I'm talking about. Um, was this, so excuse the, this basically, this was from a, this from a different presentation. Um, so if you look uh, at what the user is wearing, that particular piece is grown through the process of bacterial cellulosis. So from my understanding in spatial design research, this is, it doesn't, nobody's doing this. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't exist. <laughs> Nobody knows about it. It's an application that's applied particularly to textile design, I believe. Um, and it's about showing how the different disciplines can contribute to a greater or a larger picture. So that's why I continued to do my, um, my research. And also I wanted to use, show how design can play a role in helping people that you know, are most vulnerable or in need and show how government policies are neglecting to listen to people directly and keep them at the you know, forefront of the conversation because they think they need something particular or they want to be living in a, I don't know, a one square meter bedroom in, I don't know, what's the furthest borough, like on the outskirts of London, but have to commute all the way to the center to go to work. Like it's unrealistic. So yeah, that's why. Sweet, yeah, that was inspiring. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Um... Yeah, we haven't got, oh, okay, I'll just unmute you. Hey, we've got another question. Hi, could you introduce yourself? Um, hello? Ooh. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you now. Oh, there seems to be some kind of like connection. Oh, hello. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just getting closer to the Wi-Fi, sorry. Um, I don't have a question, but I wanted to share something that I've noticed recently. So when you said that policymakers and them not having a creative approach, um, I agree a lot. And my partner is currently working for the government uh, and helping them respond to the homelessness issue during the crisis. And so the government says that the 90% of these people were offered um, hotel rooms and for accommodation. But obviously, th these people do have pets and they have dogs and they don't abandon their pets to take this accommodation offers. Um, so I guess when we're designing uh, solutions for these people, we also need to consider like solutions for not just humans, but for pets as well. And I just wanted to share that because it's just something that I've been thinking about um, in the recent days. Yeah, no, that's very good. Um, that's so true. Um, you'd be made a lot of people, I'm sure your, your husband knows, um, there are still people that are homeless um, on the street because of that. So they yeah. want to abandon, you know, specific situations or they're com their complex set of situations that have caused them to become homeless were just not addressed. So if someone is yeah. a, dr a heavy drug user, alcohol abuser, whatever, and they don't have mm -hmm. access to that and you put them in a room by themselves for 12 weeks, like that could be detrimental. You never know that could go in a completely wrong direction you know that's like taking someone straight to rehab and just like locking them there like you can't do that so yeah absolutely yeah i think that's great like these are the things that we have to consider that's why i say we have to you know design for the ethical conditions of today we can't mm -hmm. um assume that each person is just a sole female or male you know by themselves and is happy to just go into accommodation um and will be happy no that's not really what's yeah. happening <laughs> like, usually like those places that they're put sometimes they can be put in danger because they can be put in a room with like a dangerous quote-unquote person yeah. if that makes sense and yeah, it's not really like ideal for especially females i guess yeah um, definitely. i mean there's a number of people that i've had conversations with that have experienced homelessness that were put in temporary, different kinds of temporary accommodation. Um, and they moved from place to place, but they had specific requirements. Say for example, um, someone was sexually abused and they were put in a home with, um, you know, different, like a group of males, even though it's a temporary accommodation and it gets them off the street, that's a trigger. So yeah. that then we'll send them into a spiral. So from that, they may, you know, use drugs heavily or you know drink heavily 
And I think these are the things that we have to consider, you know, we can't just say, go here, you'll have a roof over your head. We have to understand the complexities of that particular person or the situation and find a humane, you know, option because that's almost inhumane to put someone that's been sexually abused in a home full of men that will set that off. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's important that we keep having these conversations. Otherwise, they'll just keep doing it. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing your research. It was very um, inspirational and amazing. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you for your, thanks for your comments. Yeah. Thanks everyone who's uh, who's commented. Uh, it was really like, and it was really amazing to hear uh, like your presentation, Adrian. Uh, we've reached the end of the session, so I'm um, just going to quickly wrap up and like really thank everyone. And I think it's great to sort of like be able to bring people together around like these kind of like you know uh, really topical research to, um, subjects at the moment. So thanks everyone. That was really brilliant. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you.